Welcome to Disability Empowerment Now. I'm your host, Kid Murphy DeGincini. Today I'm talking to actor Madison Kobach, who played Meredith in the musical How to Dance in Ohio. Madison, welcome to the show. Hey, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. I've really been looking forward to talking to you the entire week uh, because this show stole my heart in every possible way. I saw it six times really wish I could have seen it like 16 more, and that's just for starters. Tell me how you first became aware of the project. Um, I became aware of the project, I think through an email chain from somebody when Stuart Whitley was still Stuart Whitley. Um, I had done a previous project with them Indigo and um, they knew I was an autistic actor and they're like hey they're looking for autistic actors to do this show and I was like sure and just really fell in love with the concept and the writers like oh my gosh I love Rebecca and Jacob so much Um, just all of the the positivity behind like the development of the show was, you know, what got me into it. What was the audition process like? And then finding out you had got the role and then meeting your fellow cats mates for the first time. It was actually, so I was sending my auditions and like I didn't know you know any sort of proper setup for an audition so I was like in my basement recording my first one I I did a one and done take I had done I was working at McDonald's at that point and was doing another show and I was like oh there's so much going on but I'm so glad that my family encouraged me to do it and I sent it in and then yeah, I got a call back when I was at school and that was, I never had any in-person auditions for this show. Um, so yeah, but then I ended up going out to New York in October, 2021 uh, for the first little read through we all did together. And I met everyone a day late because I got sick. Kind of, I don't know, I've got chronic illness. Um, but yeah, sorry. I'm like trying to figure out the best way like to, um, don't worry, take your time. Meeting everybody though was, was really cool. Um, I could tell that I'm like, oh, these people are like, these people are cool. And like, I want to be friends with them. Like, and we ended up getting like really close like not right away but you know then June of 22 and Syracuse we were together a lot and yeah we just kind of became like family and it was it was really neat how was it adapting a musical or play in general for that matter short material about very real live people. Like I've run into the real Dr. Amigo several times at the (laughs) show. And he he was around a lot. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean to be honest, I refrained from seeing the documentary until after the show closed. And then I was like, 
Yeah, they'd stole that, they'd stole that, they'd stole that. Oh, wait, where's the music? <laughs> right, right. Like, I can only think of one major plot point that they, meaning Jacob and Rebecca, yeah. added to enhance or uh, do a original concept of the, right. the show. But when, when I heard someone say at the final performance, oh, the real Dr. Amigo is here, my eyes just wide because I just did not I had forgotten that was based on a documentary and right. real people and so before I go on another geek out tangent how was it uh Adapting the material and meeting some of the real life counterparts, and how did that inform your portrayal of the character itself, herself? Yeah, no. So, um, I totally agree with that. I think that the the musical How to Dance in Ohio has just become its own separate entity that is like, you know, like a lot of things that you'll see a movie and it's just like based on a true story. But like, while there's elements of truth there, like, you know, it becomes its own thing, like after so long. And I I think that there is a little bit of freedom in that, but also at the same time, I, I never, my, and I am, always trying to be very clear about this I never ever want to mimic a real person especially well I mean impressions are one thing but mimicking another disabled person is not something that I am comfortable doing no I no, am comfortable I, yeah, yeah being myself but yeah so I I wanted to make that clear to the real Meredith as well who is wonderful I love her so much she's so cool uh, I met her before I moved out to New York for this, actually. I got to meet up with her in Columbus. And, you know, she's just, she's just got this charm to her. She's so charming and so smart. She's so intelligent and will tell you anything you need to know. Like, she, you have a question, a hypothetical, she's got it figured out in seconds just give her the phone <laughs> like she um but yeah I really just wanted to make sure that I was never a caricature of somebody and if anything you know I wanted to do somebody justice like when she would she came out to see the show on opening night all seven of the original people so how would that I mean, George, knowing that the original seven were there, not not even in the front row, but anywhere in the theater, and looking up at actors like I marvel that the real Doctor Amigo comes. To this show. He wanted I to play even, Dr. Amigo. <laughs> I don't even want to uh, assume or try to get how many times he's seen that show, but a lot. It's, <laughs> I know a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like it's second home for him almost. But yeah. take me back to opening night and you you and your cat mates very aware that this is not only the third performance, the third musical of its kind in subject matter. Yeah. But also being very well aware 
the the roles you were playing, the real life counterparts were in the theater about to watch you portray their younger selves. Yeah, it was it was a wild time. I mean, a couple people had come out uh, to Syracuse to see it as well. Jessica and Caroline came out. Um, but yeah, it was it, it was so surreal. I think probably more for them than for us. I mean, it's always going to feel weird being like, I play you in a musical, but technically it's really not that even. It's kind of like, I play a character that was like based, based on, you. on you. Yeah. Like it's not. So I think, again, there's, there's so much more freedom in that, but just like, I don't know, knowing that all of them were there and they all seem to be having like, a good time like on stage like because we brought everybody up for bows like all of the real life people in the musical that were there everybody had their real life counterpart I think wow yeah so talk more about what it was like preparing for this well, how much of the documentary served as personal background and how much was, I mean, you mentioned earlier on that, and it's very important to repeat, it's by no means a mimic of any of the real life of counterparts. 100%. It's characters character based upon real people who just happen to share the same name. Uh, exactly. Yet yeah, to talk more about preparing for the war and bring your own acting ability of, uh, I don't want to say self, but. Yeah, no, some of it kind yeah. of is. Um, I think. I couldn't me, tell it... which is which, by the way. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, I. I have, again, I'm lucky enough to have played another autistic character, although Meredith is vastly different from the other character that I play, um, but, which is kind of beautiful, but, like, I tend to, like, just take my own movements and stims and things that I know I do and kind of project them onto this character, so it's never, like, some, it's something I know that I'm doing. And I think that that's where it's important to have, you know, disabled people playing disabled roles, whether it's autism, wh whether it's any, I think that the person with that disability is going to have the most experience and have the most convincing performance because they know what it's like. Yeah. And it, I don't know, I think that for everyone involved in the show that's and, and I don't want to speak for everyone but I think a lot of people did very similar things just you know kind of picked up on their own sims that they do or things that friends do and you know develop these like characters not just that character not to reduce them down to stims but you know just in one aspect of how you know I would prepare for this role. And I also just, I'm a very similar person to Meredith, the character where like, I tend to be like, no, I don't want to, no, no. But then if I go, I'm like, I end up having a good time. And I, and I know this about myself. So I kind of like to think about a younger version of me 
around like, you know, 18 where like Meredith, the character would be. And what I would do, which would probably be like, eh, <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> but yeah, that's part of how, yeah. Oh, goodness, sorry. So I keep in my head and talking to Liam after the Broadway reunion concert, which was fantastic. Thank you. Way. And also the composers. And I met Rebecca. I've interviewed Jacob. I got mm -hmm. to uh, fawn over the script with Rebecca and I actually compared it to Hamlet and I do not apologize for that at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, I can, yeah. Yeah, it's basically Hamlet without the violence or the Right, sex, exactly, yeah. And there's... with music. <laughs> that is true. You know, that's also the thing I think about a lot of old theater like that, not to get too off topic, but, um, and how many of these characters are very, like, as, as they say, neurodiverse coded or, like, disabled coded what because and it's because there was not language at that time yeah. to describe it so of course these characters are still going to be there because yeah disability has always existed yeah yeah i i remember telling liam your code star or mm -hmm. one of them fantastic we'll get into that dynamic in a little bit i kept Comparing this musical to another very recent musical, The Prom. Uh, okay, yeah. Because the characters in that, the, the dance with me aspect and the mm -hmm. coming out aspect runs throughout that entire play. The musical styles are also, in my mind, very spot on, similar, but the ending of the poem in which they dance together and kids are, is almost exactly note for note. That was what somebody said. Somebody called it, is this the prom for straight people? And I was, I was like, no, please don't do that. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, well, <laughs> damn. But I oh. totally know what you mean because it, it, you're very right about that. No, no. Well, thank you. <laughs> please compliment me more. Judge kidding. Uh, so in terms of the point I was trying to make, the ending one, two, three, four is the which it's literally the last lines of the musical. It's the same as the final action of the poem. The only thing that is mentioned that really differentiates the two ending actions is the characters in the poem kids. You yep. and Liam don't. Not. And it, we could talk about that all day. Uh, but <laughs> Well, not, it, it's just, and the one, two, three, four, really the hand grasping or hand holding mm -hmm. is, at least in my mind, very 
apt and very true to the characters you are portraying. I do agree with that. Yeah, and, but, like, I can't separate those two now because the actions, and it's a very slow build-up. With mm -hmm. both of those musicals, and you get mm -hmm. the payoff at the end, which right. is good musical theater. Let's talk about the what is it again? Oh, heritage, heritage, normative romance. Uh, mm. it, it's uh. I was trying to uh, call to mind the lines of the play. I don't believe I did it justice. It's all uh, right. But it's very much a, a, a symbol cat. Everyone gets their own song, and you all join in each other's songs. But this is America, Hollywood, Broadway. We all like our center, centering romance. Right. What would you like evolving that? And I don't want to say it's the vocal point of the musical because that would be unfair to everything else that's happening in the musical. But what would you like forming that bond and that connection with another actor? Because... Like movie, you shoot it over a few months, then it's up there for all time. You and your cats mates are literally stepping into these worlds and performing them. Each performance is a week okay. for however many weeks. And every performance has to be the third time over and over and over for these characters. characters. <clears throat> so what, is, what would that part set like? Slow um, building the romantic payoff at the end. Yeah. Um. Luckily, Liam is also he's a a very talented and witty actor, and we were like, there weren't a lot of like Meredith Drew moments in the script, so we would no, just... they want they really really want. That's also what makes it so you for it to see that payoff right so because so we would just kind of like add little like side bits here and there like we would like look one of us would be looking at the other and then the other would look and then we'd look away look back see if they're still looking and like just kind of little things like that and I don't know like we we became close pretty fast um in 2022 like in June and in Syracuse because we're staying together um but yeah it was you know changing with the script for two years I feel like the chemistry itself has always just had this baseline of like this is what it looks like and like and not in a bad way but it's also like evolved so like I don't know we also have this stupid thing where I don't know if you know, oh, hello, John Mulaney, Nick Kroll. And we'll yeah. talk to each other like this and we can't stop talking like it. And then and then everybody around us starts talking like that. 
so it's 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 easy to play opposite of somebody again like you're working with them for almost two years like you're bound to hopefully become friends like I also again good situation that ended up being good friends with my cast yeah and you don't always get that but before we go in to that like the first time I had seen the musical I had no idea what was going to happen until the opening number of the second act. Uh, before then, it's, it could go either way. You have no idea until yeah. you hear the second act open. Uh, again, very brilliantly and beautifully done. Uh, still chokes me up just thinking about it. How was it headlining that number going in to the second act and really revealing that, oh yeah, Meredith likes Drew a lot. Yeah. Too, because if you don't see them... Document. Right, it's kind of central to the plot that she does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it actually wasn't added in until Syracuse Drift wasn't. Um, and Jacob was like, I think it was actually one of the uh maybe it was the first, but I know it was one of the first um motifs that he wrote for the Meredith character, the opening, like duh, 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 like that one. Um so he he and Matt Gallagher play it for me and I'm just sitting there like oh my god that's exactly what it feels like to be in love with something or like have a little crush on someone like that's yeah and it was it's I'm really glad they added that in I think that I'm glad that autistic girlies maybe also can have like a little love song that is just for them. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. it's, no, it's no. not for anybody, honestly, it doesn't matter. But yeah. um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I was, I was so glad they added that in there. Like this was a huge missing piece in the puzzle. Like not not no pun intended there because we don't do that. But um not not puns, I mean autism speaks. Um sorry, not to get political. Um but anyway, yeah, drift. <laughs> sorry, that I don't know what that ramble was. No, that that's completely fun. The closeness of the cat is extremely, extremely evident. Uh, if I was there on day one, I would be very comfortable in saying, from day one, you guys were always like this, but you, you get that feeling both on and off stage. And you don't always get that in a production, yeah. either musical play or movie. Talk more about the what that brought to the overall experience and how, if at all, it shaped how you went in or did the latter half of the production because from an audience viewpoint, when you get to the end of the show, it's kind of 
obvious that not only are the characters pretty much family, it, it feels like you it's... all could really be related or Jacob and Rebecca just picked everyone from the same high school class, even right. though they did not no. do that. <laughs> but... No, it's, it. I think, and like you're saying with the end, a lot of that is because sometimes we were, sub especially, ooh, there were sometimes just by the end of the show, some people were just over it. And we'd be like half in character, but then just like having fun. Like, but it's a part of like you you know it's like it's the matter of like knowing when to do stuff like that because that's not something you do all the time or whatever. But you know, I think just having that closeness as a cast um made the experience like so much better. It you know, it, it felt like, I'm like, oh my God, I get to make my Broadway debut alongside my friends. Like, that's so cool. It, like, it's not like, I've, honestly, I don't think I've thought of them, as, any of them as coworkers. I don't, I like, like, they, they are my friends. I was never like, this is my coworker or my work friends. These are my friends. And yeah, we've, yeah, it's, it's been really nice to be with a group of like such friendly people. Yeah, I mean, and that didn't have to be manufactured at all. In mm -hmm. fact, if you tried to manufacture that, it, it would have been see through or come off wrong uh, right if it was up to me you guys would just be finished shooting the movie no oh. uh, jacob and rebecca would just be putting on the final touches of the second one and pre pre brainstorming the third one and be careful uh, to keep you all gainfully employed uh, uh, from your mouth to in, God's ears in my head uh, well I wish I could really make that a reality uh, for you all so let's talk about the significance because it is the first of its kind. Why do you, and I don't know if you know that, uh, Broadway has been around for quite a while now. Yeah. Why do you think now, and not now, but when you began production, why do you think then was the time that Broadway really received a long overdue wake-up call in terms of authentic representation in every single way? Right. You know, I, I think just in general, like, there's always just been, and even still now, there's like these weird, I mean, I, people are conditioned to think in ableist ways, yada, yada, whatever, boohoo. Um, but these people will have these beliefs about disabled people and that, oh, well, since they are disabled, clearly that means they don't have the intellectual capacity to do this acting job even like again autism which is a develop a neurodevelopmental disability not an intellectual disability though you can have ids like on top of autism or anything like whatever but um these people will make assumptions wrongly about that and 
that's why you see things like god i don't even i don't even want to say the examples cuz i'm like uh oh um uh like you just see neurotypical actors like playing disabled characters or able bodied characters playing physically just dis- like you we've been seeing it happen like over and over again and it's just now i think finally i think it proves a point almost because it's like you thought we couldn't do this and then we did it so now you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to your ableism <laughs> well they never really did but i would right. talking to the assistant musical director and uh, nicole uh who i've known for years but just met in person the night of the Broadway reunion show. We literally bumped into each other. Uh, And there are so many absurd and bad shit, crazy, wrong assumptions about yes. people with autism that still could sense to this very day, this yeah. very second, this right. very nanosecond. <laughs> Not exactly. What? Because I'll, I'll keep uh bring up Liam I had this very in-depth long conversation with him Mm -hmm. after the show and he doesn't know me from Adam it's George but when he was talking to me and we were surrounded by 300 people he would so laser focus on me which was amazing but it it called in the back of my head the assumption that People with autism are anti-social, unfriendly, I uh, think they're better than everyone else, unfunny, which is very untrue. Oh, oh, right, right. I'm like, oh, okay, so you haven't had a conversation with me. I Like, that's fine. But uh, that's, yeah, I I totally agree with that. And I think I like to describe sometimes is I feel like I my acting job starts more when I'm off the clock like when I'm at the stage door when I like see people like I I feel like especially again like playing autistic characters that I feel like maybe that could change if I'm playing a neurotypical character on top of it but I mean Sorry to interrupt I didn't mean to bring up any anything bad about those assumptions. Oh, it yeah. just really bothers me that they put sex to the level that they do. Like, I have cerebral palsy. Mm. If you somehow isolate my, and I'm not sure you will believe that social anxiety given my job you (laughs) can probably make that a autistic trait but then you would label everyone as autistic and therein lies the danger uh but Uh, i agree (laughs) notion that Autistic people or savants or unfriendly, mm-hmm. unfunny. Again, there 
if they weren't so downright offensive and this is coming from a non-autistic person, they yeah. were hilarious because they're so off base. It's yeah. like talk talk about, if you will, what it is like having to combat those and like-minded assumptions overtly and on a micro level every single day. Um, it, it says it's a double-edged sword being an autistic person who's like presents as like feminine so it, it it becomes a double-edged sword of people will speak to me as if I'm a child and undermine my experiences or and or because sometimes they'll do both somehow convince like if I'm having a problem like let's say somebody is doing like is is not leaving me alone. And I'm like, hey, this person's not leaving me alone. And then they weaponize this person's autism against me when I should have known better. And this is not just something that, this is not like a, on a recent event, like this has happened on multiple occasions to me. And I know that it's happened a lot to other people. Like, and I, I just, cause there's, and then in doing that, you also like infantilize the autistic person yeah. who's like doing the action, like, Sorry, again, to divert the topic, but well, like, please. I think sometimes people, and it is an ableist assumption, think that because somebody's autistic, that they couldn't possibly do anything wrong. But then also when the people they're affecting are autistic. No, so you're in, <laughs> people assume you're an angel. But also a devil. I mean, it's like... <sighs> it just depends on who you run into and that is just the double-edged sword of trying to navigate that and also to teach myself and unlearn things that I've like be like been made to believe about what people say and it's like well that's just not true like from either side whether it's the infantilizing side or the you know, devaluing side well yeah. Or, oh, sorry, I just thought about this. They'll also, they love to pull the, but you don't remind me of so-and-so that I know who is an autistic child. And yeah, I know you've heard that one before too. Um, because, and it's insane to me that the people will still, yeah. I just think, I think having an open mind is all, like, as long as somebody comes to me with an open mind, if you say something that's a little like, oh, I'll try to politely correct on terminology and be like, hey, so actually this is what like the terminology is because it's important to me. But yeah, it's, it, it's a mess, but you get through it. Life throws you hurdles, but you just got to, yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, God forbid you have a part that, that like, what? Artistic people like being in relationships? We right. had no idea. No, None. exactly. What whatsoever. Exactly. Oh, yeah. No, that's Aren't such a big problem. Aren't you just... Age sexual, not to minimize or trivialize that. But right. Isn't... But I think it's a wrongful assumption to yeah. think that any disabled person can't have intimacy or romance yeah, or relationships. I mean, it should all, but it's packing it in to all the other, again, and not making light, if they want so offensive all of the assumptions would 
probably be hilarious. Will probably make a right great if people didn't believe comedy. these things. If people didn't genuinely believe it, like yeah, you would think somebody's joking when they say some of the things. And I'm like, oh, that was serious. Oh, All right. you might to hold hands with your partner. I thought that all autistic people didn't like to be touched. Well, and that's the thing. And it also comes down to the thing of consent. And anybody yeah. disabled or not can learn consent. And yeah. if you do not have the capacity to learn consent, then you shouldn't be allowed to date. But most people have the capacity to know yeah. is this okay yes or no and go based off of that and it's you know I feel like also a, a lot of not all but there are some autism like I I recognize at the stage door a lot for how to dance in Ohio people would ask uh, a lot of them were neurodiverse themselves would ask if they could take a picture and st whereas other people may grab or like just kind of shove a camera in your face. Like, I asked there's a Liam huge. If I, I asked Liam if I could touch him before I touched him for the right. picture. It's just. It's basic consent. <laughs> yeah, it's consent, it's courtesy, but again, and respect. the most important thing is it's consent. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, there's just oh, so many misconceptions, but I think I think there's there's like new things in the works that should be able to break those down. You know, I'm hoping for that. And so we could talk for hours and hours and hours about everything that <laughs> so represents the significance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the Modes, mental, meaningful highlights of personal stories that you've taken away from this production. Oh, wow. There's a lot. I, I just really loved being at that theater. I, I tell this story all the time, but the first Broadway show I ever saw was Hedwig and the Great Inch in 2015 at the Belasco. And then I ended no, it up would, like, uh, like a home coming for you. Yeah, kind of. I mean, like it was for a long time, like one of the only Broadway theaters that I knew what the interior looked like. Cause I was, I'm from Indiana. I wasn't going to Broadway shows all the time. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it's just, such a lovely experience to be there and be there with my friends like just hanging out at the theater after a show like uh it's, it's so much fun and there are a lot of stage door experiences I had as well that were very meaningful like there are just a lot of people that related to the characters and you know, tell me personal stories. And a lot of people like gave gifts and art. Like there's really talented artists who've been making stuff for like fan art for How to Dance in Ohio. Um, yeah, just to see all like the creativity and like stuff and the joy that came out of the community, like cultivating around this show was just really cool to see as well because you don't always get that with like a, a group of fans no no absolutely not you don't and it, it's just the amount of love and people who would see this show over and over like I follow Jacob's Instagram thanks uh, for following uh, me back uh, by the way uh, uh -huh. 
Oh, of when, course. When he when he posted a uh, couple's reaction to, oh, this is a uh, upwards of twenty of time seeing this show. I was like, uh, mm -hmm. uh that uh, I. I, I'm obsessed with musical theater, but I, I, I right. don't. What do you think it is about this show that spoke so concretely and directly to people? You know, I think it's a lot about the subject matter and the characters, specifically the main seven. I think a lot of people, since like, and again, it's like not the the whole spectrum. Obviously, we can't represent everybody, but I think a lot of people related to different characters. And since there were options, and there wasn't just the token neuro neurodiverse one, the token disabled one. Like, there's there's seven, and so you have a wider array of characters that you can relate with and experiences that you might relate with. And just, yeah, I don't know. I think, and I think also just the idea, like it was such a win for theater people in the autistic community that we finally got to be autistic characters instead of a neurotypical doing it. So like we're making progress slowly, but surely. <laughs> If there was a sequel, and again, from my lips mm. to God's ears, uh, what would be some areas in which you would want to see explored in a hypothetical sequel? Um... I would probably, I would, I want to see more about the Drew and Meredith timeline. I want to see what happens with that. Like, regardless of whether it's just kind of awkward and then nothing happens or if they like, it's like a passionate romance. Like it, it's, it's anyone's game. Like it's, but it's I think really that'd be, I think I'd also love to see like that, like everybody being like, their own like life episode like if if honestly like probably more like a tv show like where yeah. you can like follow a character's like story for like an episode and then like switch to like and they come together like whatever i don't know but yeah probably something so, with the druidic pipeline <laughs> so one thing that I will want to see, but besides somehow being in the sequel, you dream big or you go home. Right. <laughs> That's right. exactly a uh, homie jig. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's like there was a very tender moment in the third half of the third act, where we're introduced to Mel and Ashley's previous yes. friendship yes. before the events of the play. And we don't I would know love to see that. If that's a friendship, if that's a sistership, if that's a romance. I, again, anyone's game. <laughs> you, you get a sort of payoff at the end, near the end of Act Two with reincarnation, but that, and then here's another thing. What if actually Omega? Omega. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what if actually it's autistic? 
that you know we also we had an autistic swing cover for Ashley and I was just like thinking about that and I was like that fully changes the narrative of the story but it, nice. like I kind of I really love the implications that 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 could carry like I th I think that that would be cool to explore but again like since it's based on real people and I mean not that the real Ashley would care but yeah it, you know it's yeah I think that would have been that would be cool to explore I mean a sequel is really hard because of the source material Right. Uh, and doing it and the real life people behind it, Judge says, uh, creatively, creatively and otherwise. Uh, but it really is, really fascinating to see how well this show did in a very heartwarming way that didn't play up the inspirational angle. Right, yeah. I'm I keep glad. using the term heart felt because mm -hmm. I saw that in a review, but also it is heart felt. I mean, I don't yeah. go see musicals beyond two or three times. There are just two, I mean, it's broad. Wait, come on. There's just to many to see, but there's something about the music wanting to see the characters again and again and again. And I'll tell you something, after the first time I saw it, I saw my former partner in it, I saw my cousin in it, I saw so many family in it. I, I don't always need to see myself or my disability represented. Right. That's not the point at yeah. all. When one of us wins it's we a win all... for everyone i mean <laughs> i agree you, with that fully you could say that i mean if you've met one autistic person you've met one autistic person the reason you could make a very similar uh saying to cerebral palsy how i get around that in my own advocacy is that i consider cerebral palsy to be a universe within itself because hmm. it's so diverse in terms of their characteristics right different times uh, yeah. When I first saw the play, the musical, the soundtrack wasn't out yet. And I had a moment of panic. Well, what if they don't release the soundtrack? Yeah. So I kept going to see it because I couldn't get the songs out of my what? head. Thank you, Jacob and Rebecca for that. Uh, wrapping up and I man, <laughs> I'm almost called you the character name. You're good. Madison, I, I want to thank you uh, for coming on. Uh, we're not done yet, but we thank you. And I do hope you will come back uh, yeah. on this show. You always have a place here. I hope you know that. 
add you. all of your cat's mates, your friends, and you so right. If there wasn't a cat's party at the end of the Broadway reunion show, I would have swatched and took you all out. It would uh -huh. that. Uh, and I'm not just saying that to be nice. It's just that camaraderie, you kind of get addicted to that authentic authenticity and being around it because yeah. you don't it's unfortunately very rare in this world. Two more questions before I let you go. Sort of wrapping up uh, Rich yeah. Hart. One of the discussion uh, like the sequel that needs to be written. Right, My right. To God. <laughs> uh, if there are any inspiring actors, dancers, singers, uh, a lot of your fellow cats members are singers and songwriters, which didn't surprise me at yeah. all. Yeah. You, all of you are triple traps. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about the dancing for me, dancers, but... <laughs> well, well, take the compliment. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Even though we tried. So All good. Yeah. If there are any inspiring actors, dancers, musicians, or self advocates wanting to make their chosen field their chosen field, what are some action points you would give them? Oh God, I don't even know. Like, uh, I I don't know. To be honest, I don't know how I got here. I just kind of ended up, I would just say like, be true to yourself and, you know, follow where you, your soul leads you. I think that's just the best general advice I can give for anyone. But especially in, in acting, like it's going to be a hard career to do. So, I mean, comparatively to what, like, there are much like harder, like there are harder career. Like, I don't want to even talk about what's harder and what's not. But yeah, it, it can be, um, and a very inconsistent industry. So just kind of like stay patient and, you know, sharpen up on your skills. So I like to think, and I really hope that both people with disabilities and those who have yet to discover or embrace their own disabilities both mm -hmm. listen and watch this program. But I'm not naive to think that both groups will take the same things away from each episode. And we've talked about a lot of topics on this episode as my guests what do you hope that people, that advocates with disabilities take away from everything we've talked about? And what do you hope that people who have yet to discover or embrace their own disabilities take away from this episode? 
Um, yeah, I think just uh, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't um, everybody has different sets of strengths and challenges, disabled or not. And I think at the end of the day, we should be able to acknowledge other people's struggles, but also their, you know, their wins, their successes, their happiness, like, and to just look at people with compassion and, you know, and stand firm in what you believe in and don't be afraid to voice your mind because nobody else is going to do it, especially if you're around a, a lot of neurotypicals I've found. So just speak up because somebody wants to say it and yeah what do you hope that neurotypicals or what is academically referred to as temporarily abled body or test yes uh what do you hope that they take away from everything we've talked about Again, very similar, you know, just kind of keep an open mind to the people around you just because you may not understand what somebody's going through or what somebody's doing based off of a, a few second interaction. Like, you know, shouldn't warrant any like, I don't know, any like negative reactions or things like that. I think that if we can all just, you know, take a minute and recollect ourselves and, you know, show compassion to the people around us. I think that, you know, life just gets a lot easier. Madison, I want to thank you again so much for coming on. This has been such a great interview and I, really appreciate and admire your authenticity and the entire cast. It's, again, addicting and euphoric to be around it even for a few minutes to a few hours and seeing it brought to, brought to life on stage. If someone wants to learn more about you or follow your growing career, how would they be able to do that? Um, my Instagram is uh, my name, Madison Kopeck, with a period between Madison and Kopeck. Um, I'm most active on there. Uh, so that's probably where I would say is best to look out. I'm not very good at social media, to be honest. So I, I'm still working on that, but Instagram is where I usually am. Well, Madison, again, Feels like the fifth time I'd thank you very profuse. Like, uh, I'm always touched uh, that people are excited to come on this program and talk about everything related to being disabled and living authentically in a ableist world. I do hope you will come back soon. I hope we run into each other yeah. in the city. And I, I look forward to seeing you again on your next big show. Thank you. Uh, I know you will add 54 and below right before this. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Thank and you. Say hi to all of your friends for me. Uh, Will do. Again, even though I'm not autistic, I grew very attached to this production 
because of the long overdue authentic casting and the amount of love, care, and heart that emanated throughout every note and every syllable that came out on the stage. And so thank you again for being a part of that. Chris, thank you. That means a lot. And thank you so much for having me on. I love to talk about disability representation and empowerment. Always down to chat. Take care. Bye.